Right, we're all, all set, right. yeah. Oops, there we go. We're being recorded now. Welcome everybody out there in the wine world. Uh, my name is Jeff McGinnis and I'm the National Beverage Director for the Wine Styles Tasting Station family of stores. Uh, very excited to be sharing a brand new event that we're launching with this uh, Zoom event, I would say. Uh, but in reality, it's not really a brand new event. It's more of a modification or enhancement um, of a program we've been running for a number of years across all of our networks. Um, every single month, we uh, strive to find a winery that we love their wines, their story, uh, their terroir, uh, their winemaker. And uh, we do national programming for all of our stores where every single month uh, you can come into the store and kind of experience that winery, learn about uh, their history, their terroir, their philosophy, um, and perhaps most important, drink and taste and enjoy their wines. Obviously, obviously with the current environment, uh, that is something that we're being a little bit cautious about. So we decided to uh, launch this virtual uh, National Winery Spotlight program as a way to continue to provide you the education and programming and access to wines that we all of our stores love. And so moving forward, we'll be doing this for quite, quite a while. Um, stay tuned very soon. We'll be launching the information about our July and August virtual winery spotlight programs. We are assuming that this is going to be a huge success already and that people are going to want to sign up for that right away. Um, before I introduce our special guests, I do want to give a shout out to the stores that are participating. They can either uh, wave or chime in and say hi. Um, first and foremost, we got uh, West Des Moines, Iowa. We have our fearless leaders, Brian Andrew McGinnis, as well as Matt Searin, uh, their store manager, participating uh, with a number of their customers. They're waving there. They're kind of way in the background. Um, we have Mindy Dayton. Uh, Mindy and Paul are from our Ankeny store um, just north of Des Moines. Uh, we also have Alan and Gina Graham. Uh, Alan and Gina Graham have been with the Wine Styles family for quite some time. They have a store uh, in Johnston, Iowa. And then we have another store in a wonderful neighborhood, the north side of um, Chicago called Norwood Park. Uh, Emily Wilderman uh, recently opened that store, I should say relocated from a really tiny location uh, to a much larger location. And then myself, I'm participating uh, from our Corville location here uh, in Iowa as well. Uh, before I move on, I want to let the Corville folks know that I screwed up your tasting order. Uh, wine number one is actually wine number two. Wine number two is actually wine number one, but everybody else should have theirs uh, correct. Um, with no further ado, I'm going to announce uh, our first special guest, or a couple of our special guests, and then he'll kind of lead us into our, our supreme special guest. Uh, but we have Chris Rowe um, and Dave Jesperson with us. They are with Old Bridge Cellars. Um, Old Bridge Cellars is an important supplier company that Wine Styles as a network has been doing uh, business with long before my involvement in the company. Um, I joined in 2012, but I know we've been doing wine clubs with them. We've been doing winery spotlights. Uh, their wines find their way into our weekly tasting events at all of our stores, into our education programs, largely because many of the wineries that they have and represent um, fit what we try to do and over deliver on price. Uh, by way of example, um, last month or the month before, we featured the Sticky Beak and the Mason Leonvoy wines uh, in our wine club program, and those came from Chris, uh, and he gave us some amazing uh, offers on those. And so uh, we continue to find new and cool things to do with Chris and Old Bridge Cellars. Um, Chris, maybe kind of introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about uh, what Old Bridge Cellars is in, and then lead us into to Dierenberg and talking with Chester. Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot. You guys have been great partners with us for oh, well over a decade. And this is my 16th year with Old Bridge, so I know the company quite intimately. We started out as a small import company that focused on family wineries. Uh, all of them at the time were out of Australia, and Dierenberg was actually number one for us. So we've been doing business with Chester and his family um, for the longest out of anyone. And it's truly a pleasure to work with small family regional-based wines, which is essentially what Dierenberg epitomizes for us. So. There's nothing that um, showcases what we do as an importer, more so than Dierenberg. They are working on the fifth generation now. I'll have Chester to talk a little bit more about that, but um, his dad, uh, Deary, is still very much alive and active within the winery. And he has three beautiful daughters that are the fifth generation that uh, are working in various forms within the winery itself. So uh, it's kind of easy to say that without Dierenberg, there probably would be no Old Bridge sellers because uh, without their support, 
from the get-go, we probably wouldn't have had the volume to continue to be who we are today. And Chester is instrumental in bringing uh, a fair amount of wineries on board very early on when we started out in 1993. Uh, so that's a tiny bit about us. Uh, and because uh, I think this is Chester and I's 12th Zoom call together, we, he and I have it down pretty, pretty well. And so much so that um, I, I think I knew what shirt he was going to wear today. So I'm going to take that volley and throw it over, over to Chester. And as always, Chester, thank you for hosting and taking a time out of your busy morning. Uh, for those of you who don't know the time uh, change, it's actually tomorrow and 8.30 in the morning over to Adelaide. So uh, he's, uh, he's always up bright and early for us. And Chester, take it away. Yeah, thanks, uh, Chris and uh, Jeff and everyone. Welcome. Um, great to be here. I'm, I'm doing, uh, I think, on average, a webinar nearly every day now. <laughs> England usually late in the day, sometimes like 10 or 11 o'clock at night. And uh, in America, always first thing in the morning, and a few around the Australia in any time of the day, but, which is great. So I'll give you a bit of background about Derenberg, first of all. Um, my great-grandfather bought the vineyard in 1912. He was a uh, director of Hardy's Wines, treasurer of Hardy's Wines from 1881 uh, until 1912 when he bought the vineyard. And, and so he, we've been in the wine industry in McLarenville for nearly 140 years. Um, he built the winery in 1927, uh, but was making wine in a small way before then. We uh, still use all of the same open fermenters, uh, submerged cap open fermenter technique and foot treading uh, for all of our reds. Uh, so, you know, they're two to five ton in size. And we've got lots of those. Um, we, uh, we basket press still everything. And so everything's still made in fact in the same way. And even the vineyards have really uh, returned back to the, uh, the old ways, I suppose, uh, before tractors, actually. Uh, so my father joined the company in the 19, early 1940s. Um, in 1948, he got the first rubber tied tractor in McLaren Vale, which he loved. He could bore up and down the rows and kill all the, the plants and cultivate the rotary. And then I, when I finished the Roseworthy degree in winemaking in 1983, I came back home and some years later I went, oh, we're going to stop cultivation. We're going to stop um, uh, fertilizers. We're going to stop herbicides. we stop irrigating uh, if we can. And uh, and Dad said, well, we better sell the vineyard now while we can get something for it before they all die. Um, but actually, uh, he was quite amazed at how well they, uh, the vines uh, cope with it and, and thrive. In fact, I'll, I'll talk more about that as we get into the wines, what the, uh, what the differences are. And, and then gradually, um, we acquired more and more vineyards. We're now at about uh, 500 acres, or what's that, 200 hectares of vines uh, in McLaren Vale. And we buy from about half of our growers that we buy from as well. Um, and um, we're uh, the largest uh, biodynamic grower in Australia. Uh, so we're all, all our vineyards are organic and biodynamic. But uh, we might, uh, time's getting on, we might, you're probably all suffering from uh, senosilicophobia. Um, this is uh, the fear of an empty glass. Um, it's a wine that we have, which is Sagrantino and Sinsto. But uh, yeah, it's a, I had a cat called Booze, whose real name was non alcoholic Booze. I called him booze for short. So he thought he could drink being called booze, but he wasn't allowed to drink. So he suffered from cynicophobia all his life. Um, but anyway, well, hopefully everyone's got the, uh, the dry damn reason. Um, uh, we actually have just launched the 2020 over here, which I'm sure you haven't got because it only came out a week or two ago here. But um, the, this is a, we've been making reason in McLaren Vale since the, 1920s, I think is when it was first planted. One of the first places to plant uh, grapes in uh, in South Australia was uh, was uh, uh, Riesling was McLaren Vale. Now uh, McLaren Vale got a good reputation for Riesling in the 70s, and as did Clare and Eden Valley. But um, the demand for Riesling was so high that a lot of people started machine pruning them and leaving a lot of buds on the vines in McLaren Vale. And so they got shoots that were short and shoots that were long on the same vine with grapes that were underripe and grapes that were overripe on the same vine. So for, for many years, the Clown Vale was tarnished with the reputation for making quite broad reasonings that people got quite right. And uh, about uh, 20 odd years ago, I started uh, going through, working out what the best vineyards are probably likely to be and, and prune them right back to only one tonne per acre. Uh, they're dry growing, old vines, 60 odd uh, years old now. 
and uh, and uh, um, pick them quite early. So by getting them down to one ton an acre, all hard fruit, then the, the grapes are at the same sugar level on the vine all over. So actually, when they go out there and taste the grapes and they're not quite ripe, you can see all that hard acid, it's a bit green or skit. Three days later, you'll still see the acid there, but you'll see this beautiful sherbet, lime-like zing in the uh, fruity character in the grapes. Uh, and if you, if you wait another three or four days later, they'll be fruitier, but you'll lose that sherbet zing. So that's, that's really where we like to be. Uh, and, uh, and it's somewhere around nine and a half and 10% uh, abome uh, or, or you know, potential alcohol. So, so we usually end up around 10% alcohol in the final wine. Um, of course, acid is high. So it's a, the, the pH is usually around 2.8 something. And, the, uh, and we have to keep sugar in there to, for three reasons, or two reasons, I suppose, to balance. It's a triangle of alcohol, sugar, and acid that you've got to get right. Um, and so the, the, uh, the sugar will help to fill up the weight of the wine, being 10% alcohol, you know, thin wine. And so sugar helps to make the wine give more weight. And then also to reduce the effect of the acid being hard and steely. So, so you get that, that triangle and it's relatively Germanic, the, uh, the style I suppose I make. Uh, but I try to make it so the, the sugar is actually quite integrated. Um, the other thing uh, I aim for is trying to make a wine that will age for a long, long time. And so uh, this is actually uh, uh, done by uh, pressing it straight away. So no skin contact. So actually we use basket presses, which uh, most people find amazing that we're doing whites through basket press in a reasonable size winery. But because they only hold two tons, as soon as two tons picked, it comes in and we can press it and remove the juice from the skins. Uh, within 10 minutes, we're doing a, a cut between free run and pressings. The pressings go to the stump jump wines and the free run makes this wine, of course. Um, and Chester, uh, I'm gonna interject just a little bit. So some people might not be familiar with the, the breadth of wines that you make. So uh, you make 70 plus different wines. I think 76 we talked about the last time. And each one, of course, as, you, as your dad, we talked about about six weeks ago, he made 20, more than 20 different wines back uh, in the 60s and 70s. And you've expanded upon that. And in order to keep them separate and, and, and understandable, you've actually named them all. So for those of you who haven't joined or, or, or seen the breadth of Dierenberg wines, there's a different name for uh, every wine and each one uh, can be funnier than the other one, but they all have a reason behind them. So Chester will talk a little bit about where that name came from. Um, but uh, if you love what you see today, there are 70 more wines to uh, explore from the Dierenberg range. Yeah, so uh, the uh, dry dam name actually comes from uh, uh, the, uh, the neighbor put in a dam back in the 80s, I think it was, and uh, the, it didn't rain. And so the dam was dry and we thought, well, that's a good name for a dry style of Riesling. That's how it used to be. It was actually bone dry, not, not any sugar. And then uh, we, uh, uh, the next year it rained, but it didn't hold any uh, moisture. So it didn't, it leaked out. So we jinxed the dam actually. But, uh, but yeah, this uh, 76 wines, all the crazy names. Uh, and I also have props for each of the label names. So this is the prop for, the, for this label name. It's a mouth dam for uh, dentistry, the only dam I could really find. Uh, but uh, yeah, so the, uh, and I've got a, there's a cartoon here of the, uh, of the dry dam as well, there we are. Um, uh, with a little yabby, you can see there, uh, crawling into the, the water, uh, the last little bit of water, and um, you know, someone enjoying a glass of dry dam, obviously. Um, but uh, the, what, so by no skin contact, no pressings, uh, no oak, obviously, in this reason, then the style is extremely youthful for a long time. And uh, this, this wine style can be drunk in 50 or 60 years. Uh, and that's, that's where we've been going. I've been drinking uh, 40, with, with uh, COVID um, isolation. I've been drinking lots of the 40-year-old uh, the, uh, you know, Australian Riesings lately, and it's been amazing to be how beautiful they can be. Uh, but uh, if, you, if you make it this way and screw cap and everything else, there's no doubt we could, we could be doing it for a lot longer than 40 years. So, so, and we've been winning the trophy in the National Riesling Challenge for the best 10-year-old Riesling in, uh, in uh, well, actually it's open to the world. But, uh, so we've won that trophy in the last five years twice for different vintages of the dry dam. 
So uh, we should um, move along to the next one, which is the uh, the hermit crab. Uh, I'm not sure what vintage you've got there, um, but uh, this is actually the 2018. You're probably on 17 or 16. Yeah, they're on 17. We're on 17. We're about to ship 18. Yeah, some of the yeah, stores, right. some of the stores do have 2018. I think Iowa, Iowa might already be on 2018 as well. Yeah, I think you guys actually were. You're one of the first states that actually we uh, we shipped it to. Yeah. So um, uh, the hermit crab is called the hermit crab because Marsan is the major white grape of hermitage. Hermitage translated means house of the hermit, and a hermit crab carries his house around the whole time. And there are hermit crabs on the beaches at McLaren Bar. And hermit crabs as fossils in the limestone. So the roots are down there of the vines, sucking up little bits of fossilized hermit crab into the grapes and into the wine. So if you can see a little bit of minerality in this wine, a little boniness, it's hermit crabs that you're drinking. Um, I've added them there, effectively. Uh, now, um, uh, it's, uh, the 17 and uh, is, I think, um, uh, around 30% uh, Marsan and the 18, I think, is higher. Uh, I don't know whether it says the percentages on there, but I've, well, uh, I've, I think that's how it was. Um, and um, uh, the uh, 17 was a very cool vintage, and 18 was a much warmer vintage. Uh, so you, the 17 is uh, quite a bit more elegant. And the 18 is much more uh, assertive, more fruit, more flavours and everything. I actually, uh, personally, I prefer the 18 to the 17. I think the warmer years work quite well for, uh, for Viognia and Marsan in McLaren Vale. It's, we're actually uh, about a degree colder than Chateauneuf du Pap here in McLaren Vale. So, uh, so uh, the, that makes warmer years make it, I suppose, more like the south of France and south of the Rhone. But um, uh, the, um, the Viognia is made from two clones. One in, came out in a suitcase back in the 70s uh, to a winery in Victoria. And I uh, started propagating that back in the 1990s. We were the first to plant Bionia in McLaren Vale. Actually, us and our growers planted 140 acres of Bionia before we'd actually made a wine, which was a, a bit of an accident, really. Uh, growers were saying, I can't plant more Shiraz during the red wine boom of the 1990s, the export boom. They said, we want to plant uh, uh, whites. So I said, we'll plant Bionia. And then, yeah, we had 140 acres. So, that's why this wine's actually quite affordable because uh, we've got to get rid of it somehow. Uh, but um, the, uh, the, the Viognier uh, is half from this Chateau Grier clone, uh, which is orange berries, uh, loose clusters, uh, bigger internodes, has more ginger spice and uh, an apricot uh, and orange rind like notes. The other clone is from Montpellier, and this is more uh, closer spaced nodes. Uh, smaller berries, smaller clusters with tighter clusters that are greener berries that get bronzed on the outside in the sun. And this one has more of a nectar and apricot character and uh, a different blossom uh, note to it. Um, and I picked the Viognia quite early. I like to, this one's only about 13% alcohol. A lot of the chondrias are 15 or even 16% alcohol. I, I'm not trying to make it too big and heavy, uh, and uh, I want to have it long and uh, and have some nice mineral acidity in there. Uh, and there's 8% barrel fermentation with the Viognia to give uh, nuttiness and some textures, richness, some solids, ferments, and uh, I like <laughs> this just wife there giving me a wave, or someone a wave, I don't know. Anyway, uh, that's the that's the mom. Not the first time she's been confused as my wife, but that's the mom. Oh, uh, well, she's only about three millimeters high on my screen with all the blocks, so it's a little bit hard to see. It's uh, lucky we actually have, I can work yeah, out cousins, the, yeah, cousins that are on the call too, so she's waving to them, I think. But yeah, sorry. <laughs> that's correct. Uh, the uh, and so um, uh, um, yeah, the. the uh, we get complexity from the wood part. Now, the Marsan actually has a big impact in this wine. You'll notice smelling it. You can see this real uh, pistachio nut, green mango, green papaya character. And that's really the Marsan. Uh, and uh, half the Marsan is grown on a gray cracking clay that shatters the roots as the season goes on in the slightly warmer part of McLaren Vale. And the, uh, so it looks like, you know, Marsan is a high yielding variety. You can get 10 tons an acre easily in, Marsan in a good vigorous soil. Um, but uh, uh, here it sets quite well at like uh, about seven or eight ton an acre, it looks like. But the, as soon as sets finish, then we're getting into the season, the, uh, the roots will shatter, the cracks shatter the roots of the vines. 
and a very say, extremely small. And they slow down ripening as you get further into the season. The last stages of ripening really slow right down. And we only end up with about one and a half ton an acre of these small berries. And it gets this pungent green pistachio nut-like character, which is really interesting in the wine. Chester, um, with, the, uh, with the roots cracking like that, it, it obviously shows the resiliency of a vine because they can come right back and, and come back the next season, right? Yeah, yeah, they're, they're, because of the next season starts off again, the, you know, the roots are all sitting there in, in, uh, in clay. You know, they all start, the clay has a lot of moisture and it's a very friable clay, so they move very fast. And it's on limestone, so it drains quickly, so there's no problem with wet feet and whatever. So they all grow back again. Um, it, it's a difficult geology to grow on. You, you need to add fertilizer, you need to keep water up to the vines. It's a grower of ours, that one. Whereas in a lot of other geologies, it doesn't need much water and doesn't need, it uh, grows a bit different. And we get a more mineral character from our own vineyards sort of closer to the winery. Um, yeah, uh, I, think, so, I think this, I've got, yeah, I've think, got a little map here. I think this wine is, so, go ahead. Where's, where's, where's the winery on the map there? Yeah, so the winery is right in the middle. So this is the sea here uh, in McLaren Vale to the west of us. And we've got the, the mountains here to the east uh, and the south uh, there. And um, and then there's more mountains up, up further up that way uh, to the north on uh, the Adelaide Hills region. And the sea is actually again down here about another half an hour's drive, I suppose, over that way. And so we've, uh, we're actually at the top end of the peninsula. And the, the grey cracking clays are here uh, in the mass, so a little bit warmer there. Actually, this, the temperature here is about the same as Shannon to Pat. And we're one degree colder here, and it's you know, all pretty cold up here too. Um, these geologies down here are about uh, 100,000 years old. The green ones are 2.4. The orange ones are about 50. Uh, these pink ones here are about... Uh, uh, half a billion and these grey ones, or brown ones up there, are nearly a billion years old. So there's a, a lot of diversity, 40 different geologies in the Um Now oh, no, here's the, uh, the mascot for uh, the hermit crab uh, from uh, Baltimore. <laughs> but, uh, and, uh, and the cartoon for this one is, uh, there we are. Uh, so we commissioned 70 of the top cartoonists in Australia to draw caricatures of each of the label names. And uh, and so they're all different artists. They all had to drink three bottles before they did it. And you can see the, the, the <laughs> bottle there with the, uh, with the uh, fruit all over it. You know, I don't think I've ever seen it that close up uh, to, to realize that there's pictures of fruit on the hermit crab shell. So <laughs> yeah, you've got pineapple and mango and uh, yeah. Yeah, I've always just seen it as a really tiny picture. So that, yeah, it's pretty interesting. You always find something yeah. new in those. There's got, to, there's got to be some advantages of doing a webinar like this, uh, I suppose. Uh, <laughs> and and I, I probably need to apologise for the painting behind me because um, that's, I'm actually at my house on my work desk and I, and I actually bought this painting not realising it's actually slightly rude. Um, but uh, anyway, it's just art. So <laughs> but, uh, there are advantages of seeing into my mind in what I like in art, I suppose. <laughs> but, uh, uh, we, should, uh, we should hop into the next one. Uh, the dairy's original uh, uh, Shiraz Grenache, or as you can see from the 18 uh, vintage, it's a, uh, 17 vintage, sorry, here I've got, um, the, uh, it's Grenache Shiraz. So this is the first vintage that I've actually gone very slightly more Grenache than Shiraz. Um, but since the 1998 was the last time it was a slightly more Grenache. Hey, Chester, since we're not on that uh, vintage yet, but you hold up the label. There's the you have an interactive label now, right? That that'll be coming out later the year. You can see yeah, the little yeah, uh, dot see there. This little uh, sign on here, uh, where um, you can uh, download the app, uh, the Darrenberg app, and put your phone over the label and uh, see an uh, augmented reality uh, cartoon of, uh, of a lot of our range, actually, uh, like like the 19 crimes thing. Except yeah. for instead of a story of someone who went to uh, as a convict, we actually have uh, got an artist who's done a whole uh, video of uh, crazy art. Do you know what the first vintage and the first wine that we'll have in the states of that will be? Uh, well, you you can actually do it now. Okay. Uh, 
it's only it's got the stickers on there to tell people. But if you download the Darrenberg app and then uh, go over the top of it, now uh, the only problem is we're having a lot of problem with things other than iPhones. iPhones it works uh, a lot better with the other ones. I don't think I'm not sure they're working yet because um, we we didn't want to spend the quarter of a million dollars it costs to get the software to work properly. We just hijacked someone else's. Well, we paid them a little bit, but yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, so the Darrenberg original now. This is a wine that my father started making in the 50s and uh, it was called Burgundy originally. Everything was Burgundy, Claret, Moselle, Hock, Port, Sherry. That was about it really. And, uh, and so um, this was the Burgundy. And uh, my father made a huge reputation through the 60s for this wine. And, uh, and Led Evans, the great uh, Led Evans uh, journalist said that uh, why would you buy Grange when you can buy Darrenberg for a third of the price? <laughs> so, which was pretty funny if you think back, you know, a third of the price. Well, this is not a third of the price of Grange anymore. But uh, Grange has sort of gone up quite a bit since then. But um, uh, it's uh, it's only about like 51% Grenache and 49 Shiraz. Or there's a little bit of other Viognier and Marsan, Roussan, a few other little bits and pieces that go in there to give complexity and uh, that I blend into the uh, into this wine that didn't fit into our wines further up. But uh, you can see a little bit of the blossom from the Viognier. It might be like one or two percent uh, Viognier in there. Um, the, um, uh, the actually the 18 vintage of this wine is a lot more Grenache because it's a great Grenache 18. So we've actually gone to about 60 percent Grenache in the in the 18th, so you, and uh, it's a pretty exciting wine, that one. Uh, but um, the, uh, uh, we changed the name from Burgundy to Darry's Original in 1989, was where we started a transition, three year transition, and then scrapped it in 1992 completely, get the word Burgundy off level. Because of course, it's nothing to do with Burgundy at all. Um, uh, but um, I also started carbonic maceration in 1987. I started putting about eight or 10% carbonic macerated Shiraz in the wine. I tried some Grenache, it didn't really work as well as Shiraz for what I wanted in the wine. So, so yeah, about, uh, uh, about six or seven percent of this wine is, uh, is uh, uh, carbonic macerated Shiraz. So we're holding the whole clusters in uh, the bins beforehand with a bit of fermenting juice and the enzymes convert the sugar to alcohol instead of yeast. And we go about halfway, uh, half the alcohol is produced that way and then we crush it, put it on skins with submerged cap and uh, and treat it like normal ferment, but it's already a reasonable distance through the ferment. And that this gives a bubble gum like aroma and, and perfume. It gives a little elegance to the palate and uh, a very long, fine, uh, exotic uh, perfume tannin that is, uh, gives a lovely complexity to the wine. It seems to tie the Grenache and the uh, the Shiraz in together really well. The Grenache is Grenache is quite gritty. The Grenache in McLaren Vale is. It's about 6% of all plantings, 56% um, of, of plantings in McLaren Vale of Shiraz. So 6% is actually still quite significant. It's the second most, uh, sorry, third most planted red variety after, Cam after Shiraz, then Cabernet, then Grenache. But it's, of recent times, it's become extremely fashionable and, and the price of Grenache now is higher than uh, Cabernet or Shiraz uh, throughout the, the average price of McLaren Vale Grenache. It's nearly all dry grown. Uh, nearly all old bush vines. Uh, they, it is in this case all dry grown and bush vines, um, but the, the, there's not much more in McLaren Vale of Grenache that hasn't been planted for a while. Uh, and, and we have quite poor setting in Grenache, so the yields are quite low, uh, often um, under one ton an acre, um, it, partly because uh, the weather in, in spring is quite poor from the west being near the sea, and uh, so they don't they don't set very well. They shatter poorly. Also, it's one of the last to flower and set. And the light brown apple moth has started to build its populations up by then, and it loves Grenache for some reason. And so we lose at least half the crop to light brown apple moth all the time. Uh, but there's but it, that, we're not too worried about it because it it makes a better wine. Looser clusters with lovely small berries. That, with the limestone and sandstone geologies here, we get lovely structures and tannins and in our Grenache and, and very good acidity. Uh, because we're a degree colder than shallow enough to pap, our pHs usually come in at about 3.1 into the winery, that, you know, 14 potential alcohol. And uh, in fact, it can be a problem. Sometimes you can, uh, if I pick them a little bit uh, lower in, in sugar, 
and they're really low yielding vineyards, the acid is so high that we actually have a big problem for the malo to go through, and even the yeast struggles. So, so it's actually uh, it's quite interesting. But we get a red, more of a red, spicy character in our Grenaches than the than what you'll see in warmer areas, which are more dark, syrupy, and and uh, thick and rich, and and, uh, and we get a great line of grittiness. And and uh, and I always keep about uh, fifteen percent of the Grenache in small stainless steel. Uh, instead of barrel fermentation for the last part uh, of ferment. Uh, and that, that gives a, a more zesty, lively, uh, oxidative stability in the wine. Uh, Chester, would you speak a little bit to the kind of the average age of some of the uh, vines that you work with? Because Grenache is some of the oldest ones you work with on the property, right? Absolutely, yeah. We have the oldest vineyard of Grenache in McLaren Vale is owned by Darenberg, and, and, uh, and that's uh, what, 100 and, um, 108 uh, years old. And we have uh, lots of other vineyards that are planted, uh, that are, were planted in the, the 50s through to the 70s. Uh, so I suppose that makes them 50 to 80 years old. Uh, and so, yeah, there's a, it's, they're all very, very old. And bush vines, as I mentioned. Oh, uh, here's the, uh, also, um, uh, this is Derry, my father. Uh, he's actually off his face as a bobblehead. Um, uh, he's, he's got his uh, I've arms. got I've got one that's not broken. <laughs> yeah, mine's got dead arms and he's legless as well. <laughs> but, uh, um, and there's a little, there's a cartoon I've got here too of, um, of uh, my father, there he is, um, uh, treading some grapes, obviously. Um, so uh, again, we should probably keep uh, moving along. Uh, the Lovegrass Shiraz, which is what you've got next. Uh, uh, you're probably on 17, I think, would you be there, or is it 16? Uh, Jeff, I think we got 17 in for you guys for this, right? Yeah, we're on the 17, and also, I mean, I, I meant to mention it before, um, a few of these wines we also featured in our wine club six months ago or somewhere thereabouts. I know we used the Lovegrass uh, in our wine club as we used the Dry Dam Riesling. I, and I can't remember what the third was. It might have been this wine or the last wine, but I can't remember what the third was. I think we used the Custodian. The Grenache might have been, yeah. That's, you know, keeping track of all the 70-some wines or so, uh, <laughs> either in club or when we did previous spotlights or just routine tasting events. I mean, I know I know you briefly mentioned the Stump, Stump Jump brand, but we, we carry those and those fly off the shelves for us here. So, uh, but didn't mean they're up. Yeah, let's talk about the, uh, the Lovegrass. Yeah, so uh, this wine um, is called the Lovegrass because of the weed in the vineyard. Uh, which is, I think you, you might even have it called Sticky Beak or something. Uh, I don't know, I can't remember what it's called, but it's a, a sticky sticky something. It, it's actually, uh, uh, it sticks to your socks like, like a Velcro and, uh, and cats and dogs, it's awful really, the weed. And, uh, but um, there's actually uh, only 85% Shiraz in this wine. And then there's about 20 other varieties that are all attached to the Shiraz like Lovegrass. Um, hence the word love grass. Um, someone thought it was about uh, dope or you know, marijuana or something at one stage and didn't want to, thought it would be bad, bad to import into America, but uh, it wasn't about that at all. Uh, 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 this is a wine actually in a trio of wines that we've now slightly changed the label of the next vintage. You haven't got it yet. Uh, and it's in our organic range. Um, uh, and so, uh, 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 um, we certified the winery for organics in uh, 19, uh, sorry, 2018. But for, we've been doing organic viticulture for many, many years. Um, and we trial biodynamic uh, viticulture nearly 20 years ago. And, uh, and it was uh, when we changed crushes in 2009 that I decided that we should go back to biodynamics because the new crusher was more gentle. And it was, wasn't uh, breaking stalks as much or bruising seeds as much. And I found I could leave the juice in contact with the, with the skins for 20% longer. And I'll get more of the, of the skin tannins than these other seed and stalk tannins. And we're still not the same amount of tannin, but much more minerality and more fragrant fruits length. And uh, so I found that the, by uh, doing more biodynamic you know, with the cow horns and the poo and then buried and you know, spreading around the vineyard and other things. We got more mushroom, more earth, like uh, rich, creamy sort of characters. And, and so uh, 
it's a uh, it uh, uh, fitted more in the style because uh, uh, of that higher minerality that we were getting. Um, the uh, uh, Shiraz, we I suppose the youngest vines in this would be about 25 years old. Most of the vineyards in this are around the 50 odd years old, and there might even be some parcels uh, over 100 years old in there too that uh, just fall down into there. Um, there's a little bit of Viognier, as I mentioned again, so about two or three percent, uh, probably three percent Viognier in this one, uh, giving complexity. And now you've got the 17 vintage, as I mentioned. Now, 17 was a lot colder. Uh, we actually, vintage was uh, about a month after uh, other normal years around the same time. So more like the vintage is from when I started making wine back in the 80s. Uh, uh, you know, harvest has been getting more and more forward with climate change, of course. Uh, but so um, uh, has a, the, the 17 vintage has a little bit more of a red, spicy fennel lift and, uh, and a long fragrant length, you know, as it opens up in the glass, you really start to see that, uh, that length of, um, of fennel spice uh, really, really grow and lengthen and uh, those other varieties all adding bits of tannin and complexity. You know, the things in there like Sagrantino and Agnianico, Pino, uh, Petite Syrah, you, know, you name it, it's, it's in there, Grenache, Pino, you know, I've said that. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of different varieties, just little bits and pieces uh, to uh, to give complexity and make it different to the to the football Shiraz that we we have as well, which is a, a, one of our popular horse wines. My great grandfather sold all his horses in 1912 to buy the property, and football was one of the horses that he had. So you've probably got that uh, that wine. I've got a little bit of grass here uh, to uh, represent the love grass, of course, and um, I've got uh, the cartoon here of uh, people uh, uh, dining and, uh, and uh, out in the field getting covered in uh, all the sticky love grass uh, <laughs> you can see there. Um, talking about the football, I do have a, uh, uh, a prop here for the football, um, which uh, is a toilet roll holder. Um, it doesn't mean the football gives you the shits, unless you drink too much of it, of course. But uh, yeah, it's a um, uh, it's quirky little uh, thing there. Now, um, all of these wines I did mention are uh, made with no fertilizer in the vineyard. So this is important because if you're adding nitrogenous fertilizers in the vineyard, you get uh, a lot of vigor, but you also uh, start growing the vines like hydroponics. So if you're irrigating and fertilizing, you get like a hydroponic-like uh, effect where the vines aren't really using the soil or the geology to make, wine, to make the flavors. Um, and it's just getting all the nutrient from drip irrigation with fertilizer or whatever. And, and uh, you get a thin skin that is more herbal and you have to get it quite right to get uh, the carrot right. And that's where you start getting that really sort of thick, herbal, gloopy, oily wine, which I really don't like at all. And instead you can see the style that we make it as, as a nice uh, uh, re medium to rich uh, uh, tannin character in the middle part of the palate, but not too overbearing, not too oily or fat. And then that length of, of soil and, and minerality and, and uh, fragrant uh, tannins and character of the, yeah, the soil coming through. The older the vines, the more you'll see the, uh, the geology come through uh, the deeper roots. But we, we might talk more about that when we get into the dead arm. Um, so um, maybe we should uh, hop into the uh, the Galbo Garage, the next one, which is uh, one of our artisan range. So this is um, a little bit more uh, uh, up the tree, of course. Um, and uh, this is a, in the artisan range. There are about uh, twelve wines. So the the, the wines we had uh, before there were more or less our original range, although the Lovegrass is actually uh, in its own little uh, range of its own now, it's all getting, but, uh, but this is in the artisan range. It's called the Galva Garage after the Garagiste in Bordeaux. So uh, we make our wines like Garagiste does, uh, small batch, um, uh, finishing ferment in barrel, you know, basket press, foot trod. Uh, we actually foot tread the fermenters because um, we started, uh, uh, we've always been submerged cap for as long as I can remember. And I've trialed uh, plunging and everything. And, uh, and the submerged cap always makes the better, the longer wine with a, a better uh, style of earth expression and richer character and, and better tannins, not oily tannins, not uh, gloopy tannins and not broad tannins. 
and so so there um so summer cat but we we have a cool beginning of the fermentation so we cool all the ferment down uh, the uh, the grapes down if they're coming hot or we pick at night which is most of the time we pick at night so that they're um under um or they're i'm going to do the conversion they're somewhere around 60 degrees fahrenheit when they come into the winery and then um they only start slowly fermenting with only a little bit of yeast added so that it's like a bit of a cold soak and then uh, they're all whole berries so right from you know, five foot uh, down to the bottom and then as they start fermenting they start uh, co2 squashes the, the berries and the juice oozes out through the cap over a period of about five or seven days solvently extracting the flavor and color which is very different to the mechanical plunging extraction which would grind skins and seeds and uh, and you know goes in the juice for a few seconds or a minute and you know not even a minute and they pop out and they float on the top again you know people do that twice a day well, this is a very different very gentle solvent extraction and um and i i want a peak of about 86 degrees in the ferment uh, uh at halfway through the ferment and then we start cooling down the ferment uh the juice quite quickly to slow it all down and that's when we foot tread so that we mix the cool juice with the warm skins to, uh, and then reset it all again. And then it, and then it just ticks along slowly and we keep tasting to get the tannin level exactly where we want it. By having it, the skins cool at the end, we don't get uh, that broader oily tannin that I was talking about again and, and uh, a finer, more mineral perfume pronounced fragrant length. And, uh, and then we, uh, uh, um, we uh, basket press into, into barrel uh, I've only been using French oak for the last uh, um, oh, 15 years, um, and uh, uh, there's, but there's not all new. There's a lot of older oak in there. I, I don't like having too much new oak in any of the wines, but this one might have like four or five percent uh, new uh, French oak. And I'm very particular about the oak I use. It's actually uh, very, very low toast, so I don't get any of that caramel. Uh, rich smoky uh, character which, which upsets the, the true character of the wine hides the, the tail out of the earth and the, and the beautiful fragrant fruit so so it's uh it's more if anything it's a, a little bit sappy fruity sort of oak that has that has a long fragrance uh, length to it a little bit like the uh, the oak that you see from uh, Barolos you know the Slovenian oak it's got a long sort of slightly sappy character uh, and uh, and this uh, this actually just helps to lengthen the wine and and because our, our tannins are quite vibrant, the acidity is relatively high there, and they're, and they're they're vibrant mineral gritty tannins. That little bit of uh, green sappy fruit oak tannin really helps to make it linger. Just like Nebbiolo is uh, is uh, high acid and high tannin and not very weighty, so it's uh, it's sort of like the same sort of concept I'm working on here. Now I didn't I didn't uh, say uh, what the blend was here, but if, I think you're probably on the 2014, um, which is uh, uh, what is it? Um, uh, just over 50 percent uh, uh, Cabernet, and then 23 percent Merlot and 23 percent uh, Petit Verdot. Um, now the Merlot comes from Adelaide Hills, which is uh, cooler quite a bit cooler than where we are 500 meters so it's a it's about three or four degrees colder and that uh, up there it's more perfumed and more uh flowery mineral fine length rather than in mclaren Vale, merlot is bigger thicker dry red sort of style of wine and, and i prefer the cooler climate up there for the merlot and we've got a great vineyard that we work with up there um the petit Vidot is uh, all from mclaren Vale, and, and the petit Vidot is a very late ripener uh, and uh, that's why actually you don't see much in Bordeaux because Bordeaux is summer dominant rainfall and uh, and so they get, it's hard for them to, to ripen it. But Petit Verdot is great in McLaren Vale because we have very dry autumns. The weather is um, is uh, uh, um, it's fine and uh, cloudy. We have nice cool mornings and uh, and then mild days in autumn. And so so we, we can always ripen late ripening vintages, late ripening uh, vineyards and varieties. And so uh, we get a nice spiciness and and, and tight tannin. And Petit Verdot in the blend takes about eight years to open up, and then it opens up into this beautiful cassis like yeah, young sort of fresh Cabernet character. Um, uh, which is really beautiful. Um, and now, Chester, uh, Chester, I've got a couple questions on this particularly. Uh, sure. The first one is you, you hit on oak, so we just talk about the general, and I know what type of oak you use, and you hit a little bit, but it's all French, right? 
Yep. Yeah, I said that. Yeah, we got into that one. Yeah. And then uh, we had a question on this one in particular. What would you give this, consider prime time to be drinking this one, and how long would you age for the gallon? Well, along, along with all of our reds, I actually uh, like to start drinking them when they're about eight years old. Uh, and now that varies from vintage to vintage, but roughly eight years old is where I like to start drinking them. And, uh, and they can drink for many, many, many years. You know, we were drinking the 1960s, so they're like 50 years old. Uh, and, uh, and there's no doubt that many of these reds will last that long. Uh, I haven't had, uh, uh, now that we've been screw caps uh, and we don't have random oxidation, I haven't had an oxidized uh, uh, wine of ours, or one that's you know, um, you know gone past it. Uh, it, it all since uh, we started screw caps again in the, in two thousand and two, so it's nearly twenty years, and they're all still fresh and beautiful. So, so uh, it, uh, it they can last for many many years. But but as I say, eight years is where I usually like to start drinking. I mean, you can drink them younger, obviously, as you can see. Well, otherwise we're going to go bankrupt because no one's going to be they're all going to be filling up their cellar. But uh, and you can see, you can you, you know. If you like that or uh, vibrance and whatever, it's good. They're still very, very drinkable, but they, but they will, um, they will mellow and open up more and more. There'll be more fruit when they're eight years old than there is when they're uh, five years old or three years old. And and this wine particularly, this really loves age. Uh, Cabernet was actually the number one variety in McLaren Vale in 1990. There was the same number of uh, acres of Cabernet as there was Shiraz in 1990 in McLeod Vale. Uh, but the world wanted Shiraz from Australia, so everyone, because uh, there was lots of Cabernet around, so everyone started buying Shiraz. But actually, Cabernet was the most expensive grapes and the most expensive wines were Cabernet, and always it gave more, more uh, effort to your Cabernets. And you can see why it has a beautiful... Um, uh, cassis and uh, dark uh, plum character and, and, and also a little bit of spicy red light notes a bit of capsicum whatever there's always an underlying bit of mint or green bean in the Clarenvale Cabernet and that, that's actually important because if you don't have that in Cabernet it could be any variety really uh, I think you've got to have some of that leaf like edge to it and um, uh, but then we don't suffer from the donut effect. We get a lovely, rich uh, middle palate in McLaren Vale from, uh, from Cabernet. And we get lots of tannins, of course, because uh, we're quite a tannic region with all of the limestone and sandstone geology. So, so tannins are, are certainly not shy. Uh, one thing that someone said to me once to realise that the best Cabernet producing uh, places in the world have sea to the west. Uh, so obviously you've got Napa Valley and uh, Bordeaux. Uh, Margaret River, Coonawarra, McLaren Vale, Chile, whatever. So yeah, it, it's quite interesting. So we have sea to the west. We're uh, Berenberg is about eight. Uh, uh, what's that? About five miles from the sea, actually. Um, as I mentioned in that map that we I had up before. Hey Chester, um, I, I have a quick question. Um, you, you mentioned a little bit on some of the wines and the different vintages year to year. The blend changing, and I know yeah. some winemakers do that to try to accomplish maybe a specific flavor profile year to year. Um, is that something you're trying to do or is it mostly the vintage itself dictates um, your decision and how, how that blend comes together in the final wine? Yeah, well, I mean, you're right in that it's the vintage that dictates because, um, you know, sometimes the Merlot in the hills won't be as good as it, as it could be. And, uh, you know, Petit Vidot might not be as good as it could be. This is the highest level of Petit Vidot and Merlot that I've used. I, I normally aim for about 20%, actually. And some years it's, it's quite a bit lower than that. It, it just depends on the year and, and what, what looks good and is going to work with the Cabernet at the time. So it's quite, this is quite a difficult wine to me uh, when I'm coming to blend uh, to, uh, to get exactly the way I want it. And we, have, we used to have Cabernet Franc in there for a very good old vine vineyard of Cabernet Franc, uh, which actually uh, we started buying from that vineyard again. We, we lost it, unfortunately, because of the... Uh, a winemaker bought it and he was making a Cabernet Franc from it, but now he's, he doesn't want the fruit anymore. He's selling it back to us. and It's a really amazing uh, Cabernet Franc vineyard uh, uh, that is quite old. Vibe. So, so, yeah, the blend changes to, to try and get some sort of consistency. But really, I'm just trying to make the best wine I can is what it comes down to. There is actually an, uh, some very, very old clone Cabernet in here that is nearly extinct. Uh, in, uh, we have seven vineyards of this clone that is the parent of the Rennell clone, and it has uh, 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 
Poor setting. It never gets one to, over one ton an acre. It sets very poorly. In fact, this year the yields were so low that it was about 0.4 of a ton per acre because uh, of the poor flowering we had in November. But, uh, but uh, it has a strong Cabernet character, this clone. It has a really lovely dark olive and, uh, and green olive-like rich flavour and a lovely tannin, a lot of good acidity and vibrant length uh, and you know, strong Cabernet uh, cassis and, and plums. And so it's a really great clone. And the, the Copper Mine Road at uh, top uh, Cabernet is is made from that clone and that quite a few of uh, the parcels filtered out into this wine. And that's why where the Merlot helps to... Uh, soften the, uh, the tannins and, the, and the, the intensity of that clone in, in this wine. And I've got a, uh, I've got a Galba garage here. There we are. Um, there's a, oops, there's a door, there's a door. So um, uh, this might be referred to as the dummy or the outside loo. Um, but uh, uh, it's uh, actually what the winery is actually made of galvanized iron. And, uh, so, um, that uh, uh, it's uh, not only Galva Garage, we make our wine slightly the garages, but we also uh, make it in a galvanized uh, garage as well. And the cartoon for, uh, for this wine is not surprisingly uh, pretty much the same uh, with a guy getting some wine out, obviously. Um, there we are. Now we should uh, hop into the, uh, the dead arm. Um, which uh, are you on 16, I would imagine, over there right now? Um, the, uh, the dead arm, is that right? Uh, should be. Yep. Um, so, yeah, uh, 2014. Oh, you're on 14? Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, that's good because I like them with uh, a bit more age, so that's good. Yeah. Oh, cool. Uh, are you on oh, 17? Yeah. I must have gotten lucky. I must have got lucky with some. You got the seventeen. Um, well, I'll, I'll, maybe I'll talk about all the vintages uh, then, uh, or not all of them, but the, of those lot. So, um, if we actually, if we look at the last decade, two thousand and ten, um, though, uh, was quite an. Early, we picked grapes a little bit lower sugar level because they were quite ripe fruit grapes at low sugar levels, and they're really uh, spicy, fragrant wines with great style to them, uh, not too heavy or big and not dark fruits, but beautiful uh, red spicy fruits and really, really uh, slowly aging, a little bit more elegance in them. 2011 was a year where there was a bit of rain around uh, and quite cool. Uh, so um, they were, uh, they really uh, had this seaweed character, which is really perfumed. And uh, it's a lovely full juicy thing with a long fine uh, uh, fennel, uh, and, and seaweed-like length. It's really interesting and, and beautiful. Quite, quite very lifted wines. Uh, 2012 is a lot like 2014. They're big wines with uh, uh, quite solid structure, relatively dark uh, um, characters in the fruit uh, and, and, and uh, substantial tannins, I suppose. Um, 12, 14 and 16 are all actually similar like that. I think the 16s probably was the most tannic though of those three vintages uh, and, uh, and is, um, uh, but it's actually coming around really well. I'm really happy about how it's opening up now. The 16 is starting to really get some great uh, uh, licorice fruits and, and, uh, and, uh, and you know, the spices and, and all the dark things and whatever all coming out now, uh, but it's, it's still a long way to go. Uh, so the other vintages, so 2013, was uh, a bit like Barolo. There are lots and lots of fine tannins and very long, long rosy, almost rose fragrant length um, with fine tannins in there. Uh, uh, the 2015 was uh, quite a gutsy year where there are lots of earth and red spice and quite a rich earthy tannin, um, which is really quite fun and, uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, as I say, earthy, long, but gutsy. Uh, classic sort of McLaren Vale uh, stinks in the in the fifteen, uh, and then the uh, seventeen is the only vintage I think I mentioned out of those. Uh, seventeen again, really late ripening vintage, very perfumed, uh, a bit like the uh, I suppose like the eleven, the very uh, fennel and fragrant length. It's only just actually opening up that wine, uh, a, a bit more elegance, uh, less less harsh tannins as the young wine. But uh, amazing length that doesn't finish, just goes on and on and on. Uh, 
Uh, so there's a question there, but I could I missed it. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'll, re I'll read you the three that we've got, Chess. So the first one was your your view on screw cap versus cork. And then the one after that, it, the one after that's probably easy. The, the question was, is it 100 percent Shiraz? Yeah, that's easy. It's 100 percent Shiraz. It always has been. Um, uh, oh, not oh, not always. Actually, the very first vintage had a heap of cabinet in there in 1993, but that wasn't a true dead arm, I'd say. <laughs> the, um, but uh, yeah, look, screw caps are much better. Um, the wine still ages. It's like the, if you've got a dozen bottles of wines that are all sealed with cork, they're all the same wine, and they're 15 years old, and you go and open them all up, they'll all be different, depending on how much oxygen was let in, uh, especially because the corks in Australia were quite poor quality. Then, uh, and you'll have some that are badly oxidised, some that are corked, and there might be different types of cork character, like dark character or pepper or whatever. And then uh, uh, some, uh, the best one in there will be the one that let the least amount of oxygen in and has the less flavour in. That's the best cork. The screw cap one, when you compare to those, is the one closest to the best, but even more fruit and, and more uh, uh, minerality. And so, yeah, screw cap is, is uh, by far the best. Uh, what was the, uh, yeah. what vintage, because you know, for a while, obviously, when I first started, it was all cork, but what, what was the vintage that you guys pulled the trigger and did went all screw cap? Yeah, well, we went, uh, um, we did a pallet of each red in 2002 and 2003. And then in 2004, we went uh, 50% uh, in most of the red wines. And then uh, over the next few years, gradually um, went to, uh, I suppose, 95%. And only, only China and, and continental Europe were, uh, were uh, getting cork. And then we about, oh, I don't know, probably five, eight years ago, we went 100% screw cap everywhere in the world. So, uh, but, uh, and we're having no problem at all. Uh, you know, people say, oh, China doesn't, very screwed up. They do indeed. We're selling a lot of dead arm and, and our uh, top end uh, wines to China in screw cap, and they're they're perfectly comfortable with them. Um, uh, so yeah, speaking of the dead dead arm, yeah, so um, it's called the dead arm because of the if you drink too much of this wine, you'll pass out and you'll wake up lying on your arm, and it'll be numb, and it'll be a dead arm. Uh, that's, well, that's half the reason. The other half is the, uh, the vine uh, growing along uh, the wire, the arms on the wire. Well, the fungus, Utica, gets in and kills off half the vine. So only half the vine is alive. And uh, all the roots are just still feeding that small crop. So it's less stress, more soil character, and more concentration uh, uh, is what we work out in these old uh, vines infected with Utica. Now, there are three uh, geologies that uh, that I work with uh, for most of our reds. So when we look at this, so I mentioned that this is where uh, Darenberg is, um, and this is this is where we um, buy uh, uh, and grow most of our vineyards. We have about six different vineyards. Um, now um, the uh, there's a sandstone geology which is 2.4 million years old here, um, and it's normally got sand on top. So sand gives uh, gives elegance and uh, and lift, and uh, the sandstone is very friable. It can have eighty percent clay in it or no clay at all. It varies a lot, so you get a lot of different characters on the sandstone. But it but it gives a lot of earthiness and a lot of wide array of tannins, from very fine mineral tannins to big chunky uh, blocky tannins and and everything in between. Um, uh, and it's two point four million years old, which is relatively young, so it has a lot of micronutrients, which is why it has so much flavour. We have also have uh, four vineyards that are grey loam on sandstone. These are very rare. We're the only place that has those. And the grey loam always gives you more flavour than sand because it's more aggregate. And you get a lot of earthiness from that. So you're getting earthiness from that and earthiness from the sandstone. So they're the biggest, most earthy style of wines are from the, that geology and soil combination. Um, then we've got uh, uh, limestone, which is around 56 million years old which is uh, scattered around up here as well. And the limestone uh, gives a, uh, a more blocky tannin and quite a lot of it. Uh, uh, it is, uh, it's, the vines can still get through it. There's not usually much clay in it. There might be a layer of clay just above the limestone. Uh, and it doesn't normally have sand on top. In fact, it's only one place I know that does and we have that vineyard as well. But, uh, but it has uh, 
uh, either a grey loam or a red loam on top. So the grey loam again giving it earthiness uh, to that block of tenon. And then the, uh, the red loam gives more of a fennel licorice sort of perfume like character and a blood like character, slightly iodine uh, character to, uh, to the uh, Shiraz. Then um, the last geology is actually a little bit more inland up here, uh, with there, um, which is uh, a 56 million year old sand on clay. It's a deep sand, or it can vary from not much at all, but most of it's fairly deep sand. And the clay is actually hard for the vines to get in. It's quite, quite a thick layer of clay. Only the really old vines are down in the clay and, uh, and are getting uh, more of an irony, sooty character from the very old vines in that clay. But most of the vines in this district are very perfumed. We call it Blue at Springs and, uh, and uh, have a beautiful juiciness. It has hotter days there and colder nights. Um, so you get a nice perfume and uh, a nice richness. Uh, whereas we're uh, uh, half the distance toward the sea of that district. So we still get quite good diurnal variation, uh, but, uh, but with a little bit more weight and, and less heat. So we get, don't get quite a, uh, we get a bit, a bit of a cook character sometimes in the Blue at Springs, whereas we don't get that where we are, which is what's so beautiful about McLaren Vale. We've got the cooling sea breezes come in from the sea at uh, about three o'clock cooling the area down and then from night time we get all the sea breezes from the hills here um, that it cools all uh, the, the area down so we actually have a high diurnal variation in the in the middle of summer which is very important for getting fragrance and acidity into the wine uh, and getting concentration as well having a warm day um, uh, and, but the we have a very mild winter being near the sea and weather coming from the west and the top end of peninsula. So that means mild winter means mild autumn and spring as well. So we don't have frost, very rarely uh, do we ever see any frost at all. Uh, even, even in winter, there might be only a few days that they are under zero. Uh, and so, um, so it means we can always ripen grapes in cool years and we don't have the frost in the spring, so it's good. We also are in a rain shadow. So from uh, the summer storms from Queensland, so the storms up north, uh, tropics will be having big summer storms sometimes and a big tail of moisture will come down hot moist air will hit the cold uh, uh, climate south and the uh, south australia will uh, will northern south australia will get dumped on quite a lot sometimes and but the adelaide hills region which is north of us will suck the clouds dry and we're in that rain shadow so we won't get as much um, of that uh, that rain in, in when it happens, which is makes the region uh, great for organic viticulture and uh, and for not losing uh, any uh, any dil getting dilution from the rain. Of course, I do have a dead arm here, which uh, is uh, is falling apart. It's dead. It used to have a, a motor in it, and when you put a spider on the arm, it, it used to crawl on the ground. Going, ah, help me, help me like this, which so said all this, which is great because this represents Shiraz that's been growing in McLaren Vale for 200 years. And this represents the money spider Roussan, which is uh, Northern Rhone white, of course, uh, and Southern but it, And so it's the uh, Rhone white now attacking the, the red Rhone that's been there for 200 years. So it's all a bit uh, of a quirkiness. And the cartoon, I've got um, here, there we are, there's the, uh, the cartoon of the uh, the dead arm, so you can see he's uh, he's going along, uh, getting a label smacked on him and cork put in, and uh, and then he goes off into the hospital and uh, needs to uh, get his arm in a uh, sling, and that's the dead arm basically cartoon. Now I saw some questions come through, but I haven't actually got to read them. Does anyone? Chester, I've been I've been I've been answering a couple, just uh, typing it back in. Uh, one, one question was, uh, how long will your wines uh, last once they've been open? Well, yeah, that's a good thing because now in the barrel, um, we so when we basket press, we put them straight into the barrel with the, with the pressings back at it, or not the very hard pressing, but most of the pressings. And we leave them in the barrel on the leaves for, uh, with the dead arm, it's up to about 21 months. So no racking at all. Uh, and the barrel is oxidative sucking oxygen into the wine all the time and the leaves are reductive with the yeast there scavenging the oxygen so we're balancing oxidation and reduction uh, it's only a very thin layer of leaves because we haven't been plunging it's just a solvent extraction and the basket press does filter quite a few of the, of the juice 
then it's a very light layer of leaves, which is good because if it's a thick layer, you get a putrefaction of the solids and they start getting really weird smelly characters. Um, the other part of the, the solids is actually the pulp, which adds more minerality to the wine, which gives more, uh, again, more oxidative stability and more ageability to the wine, more future fruit character. So our wines have, a, they need a bit of air, you might notice all the time. Uh, there's a, just a little whiff of, of reduction often, but I don't mind that. It blows off very quickly, and, and, uh, and, but it keeps the wine fresh and lively in that, in that bottle for a lot longer, slowing down oxidation. And so uh, uh, that makes them age for a long time. But, but also it means that when you open them and you, you drink it over a couple of days, then it uh, is also uh, uh, looking great the next day. Um, if, you, if you just put a, a shot of gas in there, it can be days and days before you go back to it, it'll still be fine. Um, but uh, that's, that's one of the good things about our wines is house pours in, in the, where it's a, a wine being poured by the glass. Um, they, they actually work extremely well under those conditions. In the Dairy's Original and Football Lovegrass, they, they work really well. And Dairy's Original being half Grenache, Grenache is often oxidatively unstable, but because we've been doing uh, stainless ferment, no oak in 15% of it, uh, then it actually does have this oxidative stability for, uh, for uh, you know, having glass pour that lasts over uh, several days. Well, Chester, I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna solicit the last few questions here and because and, as always, you've been amazing talking about the wines, giving the backstories and compressing it all in a short period of time. And of course, giving this the best background I think I've seen in, uh, in, in many, many of these being done. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so, uh, so if you've got some, type them. If uh, you care to reserve your questions uh, for after, you obviously you, you can just email them to the wine sales and we'll get back to you for them. And yeah, thanks, Chester, if I don't get a chance to say it. And I know you're holding up one of your favorite toys there. Yeah, yeah, this one is uh, Julia Gillard, the ex-Prime Minister of Australia. Um, and we have a wine called the uh, Solipsic Snollygoster, one of the single vineyard Shiraz wines. The Snollygoster thinks that they're always right and they don't take anyone's opinion into account. And it's a 130-year-old uh, vineyard uh, and it, it thinks it's the, uh, the best. And it's a, a Solipsic meaning soul meaning one, and it's the only one that aged and the only one that would have been around at that time, so, so it's a lipstick solid gloss. And it introduces the fact that all of our, uh, the dead arm is actually made up of quite a few different vineyards, and we do sell single vineyard Shiraz wines that are all components of the dead arm. So all of those characters I was telling you about, you can buy the single vineyard Shiraz wines and a whole map and, uh, and uh, go through the, the, and see why the geology or the sand or the age of vines and all of these things makes a difference so it's quite uh, it's quite a fun thing to do if you're interested in having a look at some uh, rare components so i keep six barrels separate and then the rest go in to make the demo hey jeff do you uh the, and there was a question about the, the fires um which uh, i did answer um privately to the person who asked it but uh, Jess, if you want to hit on that just quickly, uh, I know you guys are very lucky where you didn't really hit, you didn't get much uh, effect from them. Yeah, it wasn't far away. Only about, uh, I suppose, uh, 15 miles away were the fires. But uh, the smoke never came to McLaren Vale. Uh, Adelaide Hills, uh, about a third of the fruit was, uh, was actually burnt. Um, and a lot of the vineyards were touched with smoke. Um, we do buy Adelaide Hills fruit for Sauvignon Blanc, uh, Pinot, Chardonnay, um, and Merlot, as I mentioned. Uh, uh, but uh, only one of our growers was affected, and, and actually uh, none of our vineyards were smoke tamed because they're in a slightly different part. They're in the cooler, higher part of uh, the Adelaide Hills. So we, we were very fortunate that we got away with uh, no problems. But they, they really got hit, the Adelaide Hills people, with. Um, with the smoke and the losing the vineyards and, and, and also the yield was so low, very bad weather in November. So none of, no one got over a ton per acre and uh, uh, mostly under that. So it was a very uneconomical year. And then they got hit with coronavirus as well, I suppose. And everything. So it's been a, been a little bit of a trying year, this one. Uh, Jeff, do you want to wrap it up? Any questions you had? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, this has been an amazing experience. I mean, um, 
the level of knowledge that we get from having this access is pretty pretty amazing. We've done a lot with De'Aaron Berg, and every time we have these opportunities, we learn a great, great deal about their wines. Um, like Chester said, they make a bunch of different wines that we've featured throughout different programs. Um, I would say two things. One, I would follow um, De'Aaron Berg on Facebook, give them a like, same thing with Old Bird Cellars. And then if you ever see anything that they have, um, you know, if, you, if you're really interested in some of those single vineyard wines, or anything that you haven't seen at one of our wine style stores, just ask. You know, we can reach out to Chris. Chris can put us in touch with Chester, and we can find a way to make uh, most anything happen because we've done a great, great job of, of featuring those wines. I hope everybody enjoyed this program. Um, I know um, some of you got tasting kits, depending on uh, whether your state allowed us to basically send you home with samples versus bottles. Um, if you uh, got the tasting kits, I know for Corville and most of the Iowa stores, uh, the pre-sale for those wines will remain open until Monday uh, with the special pricing. Um, but I would encourage you to come back into the store um, and experience those wines uh, with us once we are back fully open. I know most stores are back open in some fashion. You can come sit down, have a glass of wine, have a cheese plate, and not with some level of social distancing. Uh, things will continue to evolve, continue to change. Um, and the last thing I would say is um, be on the lookout for our next two events. Uh, coming up in July um, and in August, we'll have a similar style of event with some, wine, with some amazing wines and amazing winemakers. But we certainly set the bar pretty high here with uh, Chris and Chester. So thank you, everybody, um, for joining us. Uh, thank you, Chester, for giving us the time. Christopher, uh, Chris, thank you for always making wonderful things happen with everybody that you work with. Oh, thank you, thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Chris, and thank you, everyone, for their uh, beautiful comments. I've been reading the, the uh, text there on the, on the on saying thank you about the wines and, and whatever. So thank you very much for that. Yeah, and enjoy the rest of your Thursday, Chester, and uh, say hi to Cap for me. Will do. Yeah, say hi to Val. Cheers. I will. Cheers, guys.